Hello again, Year 10. This week we're going to be looking at Jewish migration to Britain. Um, mainly we're going to be focusing on the time period between 1880 and the start of the First World War in 1914, but we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the backstory of Jewish migration to Britain up to that point, and we're going to have a little look as well at some of the um, significance and the after effects of things that happened during that time period as well. Um, so, uh, the Jewish people, um, as you as you probably know, um, originated in in the country now called Israel, um, and it, the Jewish religion is an ancient religion, much older than Christianity, but believing in the same God and uh, sharing the Old Testament of the Bible as part of their beliefs uh, with Christians. Um, the Jewish religion was persecuted in the times of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago um, and many of the, the Jewish people had to leave uh, Judea as it was then known, the, the province of the Roman Empire in which they lived, which is, which is now Israel. Um, and this was called the Diaspora, where Jewish people spread out then after that into many, many countries um, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia as well, all over the all over the um, the old world, Jewish communities were kind of set up, and they never they never lost this kind of um, identity, this this separate identity as being part of the Jewish faith. Um, your first task is to fill in a timeline of the story of Jewish people and England uh, or Britain up until 1880. So I'm just going to talk you through some key events here on this timeline and you've got a sort of a blank version of this on your document so I'd like you to sort of fill out what happened at each step of the way. And the first point on this timeline in the 1070s is something we've already learnt about back at school a long time ago now, you've probably forgotten about it, but William the Conqueror, William the First, when he was King of England, you may recall he invited Jewish moneylenders over from Normandy um, to come and live in England and this kind of gave a big boost to the economy as you remember. So Jewish moneylenders invited over by William I. But um, it wasn't always a, um, a happy existence for Jewish people living in England in, in the medieval period. Um, they were seen as being different not just for their religion um, but also uh, the fact that they were allowed to lend money to people, whereas at that time the, the um, Christian church had banned money lending. Um, this also made them a target for people in a more kind of, um, on a more economic sort of basis. There was a certain jealousy about, or a perception that Jewish people had a lot of money, and often there would be incidences where people who owed them money um, would uh, be violent and kill them rather than have to pay back the money that they owed. Uh, and there was a horrendous incident which took place in, in the city of York in 1190 when um, the Jewish people of that town were driven into the Motton Bailey Castle, Clifford's Tower in the middle of York, uh, which was then set on fire and the entire Jewish population of York was massacred on that night in the year 1190. Some historians say this is because um, lots of people around the town owed the money, owed Jewish moneylenders money, and didn't want to pay it back. We fast forward another hundred years then to 1290, and at this point King Edward I banned all the Jewish people from Britain, and they were kind of uh, kicked out, basically. Uh, before that, there'd been thriving Jewish populations in many towns and cities, including Bristol, where archaeologists have found uh, remains of a Jewish bathhouse. Um, but all the Jews were kicked out of England uh, in 1290 by, by King Edward. And it was then uh, over 350 years until a, a Jewish po population existed in this country again. That was during the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell when he invited... Um, a Jewish community back into England. There's very complicated reasons behind that, which I don't fully understand, 
something about him thinking the end of the world was coming because of his religious beliefs. This is Cromwell I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, there were some crazy religious ideas going around at that time. Um, maybe you should read up on that and find out. It sounds like a pretty interesting story. OK, so the point is that by the year 1850, the Jewish population of England had, had, had grown to about 40,000 people. Um, so quite a significant minority of the population by that point um, were followers of the Jewish religion. Uh, one notable example is Lionel de Rothschild, who was a banker, and in the year 1850 he became Britain's first Jewish MP. Um, at first he wasn't actually allowed to sit in the House of Commons as an MP because um, you have to take an oath when you become an MP, and at that time it had to be a Christian oath. He, he came in, he'd been voted in by the people of the City of London, his constituency, um, and he went into the House of Commons and they said, you've got to do a Christian oath. He said, I don't want to do that, I'm Jewish. And they said, well, you can't come in and sit then. So he had this strange situation where he was actually an elected MP, but he wasn't allowed to sit in the House of Commons, take part in debates or anything like that. That is for a few years until he successfully changed the law and allowed MPs to um, have a variety of different types of oaths that they could do, including a Jewish one, which meant that he could finally take a seat in the House of Commons. You might remember his name, Lionel de Rothschild. As well as being an MP, he was an extremely wealthy banker, and he was the man who lent the money to the British government to buy uh, shares in the Suez Canal when that uh, around the time that Britain was getting involved in Egypt. And the Prime Minister at the time, when the Suez Canal shares were bought, was this man, Benjamin Disraeli. He was um, Britain's first Jewish Prime Minister in 1868, although he had actually converted to Christianity um, as a younger man. So he wouldn't have had any problem with taking the oath, uh, the Christian oath that Lionel de Rothschild had changed. So, you know, he was a prime minister of Jewish background, but not actually following the Jewish religion. He'd converted to Christianity. OK, so that's the situation by about the year 1880. There's a history of prejudice, um, but there's also a history of the, that Jewish population um, growing again and overcoming certain prejudices like uh, the House of Commons and then being able to take up positions within the British establishment in, um, in the House of Commons and in even uh, in number 10 Downing Street. So what happened then in 1880? Why are we focusing on this period? Well an event happened in, uh, on the 13th of March 1881 not in this country, but in St. Petersburg, which was then the capital of the Russian Empire. Those of you who, who are hoping to do um, history for A-level, this is the sort of thing we're going to be learning about. Um, in 1881, uh, the king of Russia, or the emperor, the Tsar, as they call, called their emperors, uh, Alexander II, was assassinated on the streets of St. Petersburg. Um, some assassins jumped out, threw a bomb at his carriage which was riding past. It didn't hurt him, but it badly hurt the driver. He got out to sort of see if the driver was okay. They threw another bomb. He was killed instantly. And um, the Russian Empire had a history of uh, anti-Jewish violence, you know, um, of the sort had happened in Britain back in the Middle Ages, but it was still going on uh, sporadically um, in the Russian Empire in the 1880s. And these kind of periodic waves of extreme violence against Jewish communities were known as pogroms. That's a Russian word. Um, so pogrom was like a wave of violence. People would ride in, attack a Jewish community, steal stuff, kill people. It was this horrendous experience of being a Jewish person in the Russian Empire. You never knew when the next pogrom might come or what might cause it. 
So how are these two things linked? Well, some of the assassins who killed Alexander II were Jewish. It was not nothing to do with the fact they were Jewish, they wanted to kill him, they wanted to, it, it was political reform that they were trying to achieve, they wanted to make Russia more um, liberal and free, uh, you know, more like a, a country with a parliament, like Britain. Um, but the fact that a couple of those assassins were Jewish kind of unleashed this, this extreme wave of pogroms, like nothing that they'd seen before. Huge violence against the Jewish community as a sort of revenge attack for the, the so-called um, Jewish assassins killing their emperor. And, well, what this meant was huge numbers of Jewish people in the Russian Empire thought, I don't want to live here anymore, it's not safe, I'm going to leave this country uh, and go and live somewhere where I can be free. And the place where most of them wanted to go, just the same as those Irish uh, migrants we looked at last lesson, was the United States of America. And this is why, or one of the reasons why there's such a big Jewish uh, community in cities like New York, is um, this was the sort of time when large numbers of people migrated there. But um, just the same as when we were looking at Ireland, some people couldn't afford to to get all the way to New York. And if you think about a map, you know, going from St. Petersburg to New York, Britain's on the way. So people stopped off in Britain um, and ended up staying and settling in, in the UK because it was closer. And it was still a free and democratic country where pogroms, by this point, weren't happening. Um, and so between 1880 and 1914, 120,000 Jews settled in Britain. Um, and so uh, what we're talking about there is the Jewish population going from 40,000 to 160,000. So it's quadrupled in, in quite a short period of time. So you can imagine this is going to have quite a big effect on the country. Um, there's going to be a feeling that lots and lots of people are suddenly coming in, many of them quite poor, um, looking for work, looking for housing. And so Britain had a sort of a, had a struggle with, you know, how should we, how should, or should we even be letting these people in, in the first place? And so on your sheet, I've, I've given you two quotes from MPs in Bristol, one for Bristol West, one for Bristol East. They both took part in a debate in Parliament about should we allow these Jewish refugees into our country? Um, and your task for this bit, I want you to think about, you know, what are the parallels there with the sorts of debates people have been having recently about refugees in this country? Anyway, so some people were saying um, we should let people in, you know, they're fleeing from violence, they need safety, they're men, women and children who need somewhere safe let's allow them in. And other people were saying, no, we can't trust them. You know, look at what happened to the Tsar in Russia. They might be terrorists. How, you know, they've got different religion. They speak a different language. Shut them out. Now, what's really fascinating about this, um, these debates were happening around the 1900s. Before this, there was no such thing as any kind of border control in this country. You could literally turn up... Um, from anywhere in the world and just live here. You know, people didn't move in huge numbers in the same way that they do now. And so there was never really any need for, to, to have any kind of, um, any kind of quota or any kind of law stopping people from settling in this country. And it was seen as quite a sort of a, a thing people in Britain were proud of, you know, like we're a free country, we just let anyone in, you know, we've got no problem with it. But for the first time, because of this 120,000 people coming in, Parliament said we need to um, shut the border, we need to stop people from coming in, and they passed this law called the 1905 Aliens Act. Nothing to do with other planets. Uh, aliens, in its old-fashioned sort of old -fashioned sense, meaning people from another country. And this Aliens Act, for the first time ever, 
said only a certain number of people from other countries are, are going to be allowed in to settle here. Now, this obviously was um, bad news for lots of the Jewish people who wanted to settle here and to get away from um, the dangers in their own country. I suppose it, maybe it drove more of them to find their way over to the United States, which of course, ironically now itself, is going through that, um, that kind of process of uh, perhaps trying to shut the, the, the leadership there, trying to shut the border a bit more than, you know, they've always been a country of allowing people to migrate there, um, and that's becoming less so now. Um, but if we look forward into the 1930s from this point, as of course you'll study in great depth next year, when the Nazis took over in Germany, many Jewish people in Germany wanted to leave that country as well, and many of them wanted to come here, you know, again, a free democratic country, where they wouldn't be persecuted for their race or religion, they wanted to come here. But because of this debate that had happened in the 1900s, the Aliens Act had been passed, there were quotas on migration by this point, and a lot of those Jewish people who wanted to come here and get away from the Nazis were turned away, um, which is quite a shameful episode in our history, in my opinion. Um, there were, you know, for instance, lots of some children were allowed in, on their own, but a lot of the adults who wanted to to get away from from Hitler and come here were essentially sent back to Germany. Um, now, for your final task, let's have a think about um, the effect of the Jewish migration on this country. Um, let's have a think about a couple of the famous people who are involved, uh, that you will, the businesses that you'll have heard of. Um, first of all, a lot of the Jewish people settled in East London or in other cities like Leeds and Bradford and worked in the clothing industry, um, sort of tailor shops and things like that. Some of the conditions were quite poor, um, but some Jewish refugees managed to make businesses that that really thrived, that changed this country a lot, and um, and are still with us today. So one example is Michael Marx, who was a, uh, a refugee from Russia. Uh, he went into business with uh, an Englishman called Thomas Spencer. Uh, in 1894, they set up a, a stall on Leeds Market, selling all sorts of items, which then became Marx and Spencer's and is the is the shop that we know now. Um, another example, Montague Burton, born in Kishinev in Russia. Um, he set up, he, you know, he worked in the tailoring industry. He set up a menswear business, Burton's Menswear. You can see that on the high street too. Uh, and another example, Jack Cohen, who was the, he was born in this country, but he was the son of refugees from, uh, from Russia. Uh, and he set up a business um, using the first two letters of his surname and the letters TES, which were the initials of his first suppliers for his, um, for his food business, which is Tesco. So a lot of the, you know, if you walk down an ordinary British high street, there will be a lot of businesses there that were set up by enterprising Jewish refugees at this time. So that's the story of Jewish migration to Britain in this time period, the background to it, the events that sparked it, uh, the way it caused debate in Parliament, and kind of the after effects, the impact on our country as well. Um, next lesson on Thursday, we're going to be doing an exam question which I want you to submit, which is going to be a comparison between the Jewish refugees and the Huguenot refugees from France we studied last week. Okay, I hope I explained that all right. Enjoy the work and uh, I'll see you later.